So thank you, John, for the introduction. And uh, this is uh, going to be the hands-on session on the time-dependent self-consistent harmonic approximation. Uh, especially uh, what we are going to do, we are going to compute the infrared and Raman spectrum of uh, ice. We choose ice phase 11, which is uh, a low temperature phase of ice. Um, the, but it's also a, it's a ferroelectric phase, proton ordered, so that we have a small uh, primitive cell. But it's a very good prototype also to describe the common ice that you find in your fridge. So the results we get are very mu can be very much uh, in overlap with the one the very common ice. So, uh, as always, I have updated the uh, PDF for this tutorial uh, yesterday night. So if you update the page on the SHA web scoop, you get the latest version. Nothing changed apart from some typos, so it's not that important that uh, you have the latest version. But if you want, uh, just go to the website. It's very small. It's the SHA.eu. And then from there, go to the school, and you have the link in the tutorials where to download the PDF, which is the, if you update the browser window, you get the latest version. And so we are going to uh, start with computing the infrared spectrum. And as, as Antonio was presenting this morning, infrared is related to uh, absorption, as essentially, uh, which uh, of, of light passing through the sample, and in particular, uh, what is the important quantity is the dielectric uh, tensor. Now, in this case, we are interested on the ionic part of the dielectric tensor, which is related to the susceptibility, which is, for the infrared spectrum, the dipole-dipole uh, susceptibility. So this M here, let me zoom so that it's bigger, and uh, maybe... Uh, okay, so it's a bit bigger. See, maybe better. So this is actually the susceptibility, the ionic susceptibility, which can be computed as a correlation function, as Antonio was uh, presenting, between the dipole moment of the atoms. And now, if uh, you expand the dipole moment as a small, uh, that, ge that is generated by small displacement around the average position, the centroid position of the SHA, you get this expression from the uh, correlation function which involves the effective charges, which are the derivative of the dipole moment with respect to the atomic position, times to the, displace, the correlation function of the displacements, which is the Green function uh, presented by both Antonio and is the, actually the same Green function which was also presented by Raffaello Bianco in his, uh, uh, in his uh, presentation. So the two uh, formulas actually match. Uh, and so... In this uh, uh, tutorial, we are going to compute the infrared response. And for the infrared response, as Antonio was presenting this morning, we need to compute the perturbation caused by uh, in, in introducing a, a polarization inside our system. Then we have the free evolution of the phonons, which are perturbed by this uh, dipole uh, perturbation. And then we have to measure again the polarization. So we have this, to compute these two vectors that in the case are the same because we are looking to diagonal, uh, so to a, a perturbation and observable which are the same uh, meaning. Uh, so we are going to use a different software with respect to the one that we use up to now, which is very linked to all the other, which is the TD SHA. Uh, but to do the calculation, we need, you notice, you notice immediately, we need the effective charges. And so how do we compute these effective charges? So if we go into the, so let me open a new terminal. Uh, let's zoom a bit. So if we now uh, open the uh, tutorials, which should be in desktop, I assume, I hope. Uh, SHA, yes, 0, 0,5. Okay, so this is, a, I hope uh, you should have all these files, which were uh, provided with uh, the um, with the file uh, downloaded, and so we need to compute first of all the uh, uh, the uh, effective charges. And since we are going to use the same uh, uh, data also to compute the Raman tensor later and uh, the Raman spectrum later, for the Raman spectrum we need the uh, Raman tensors. So in uh, uh, there are 
many ways of doing this kind of calculations. The one that I know <laughs> and I personally use is using Quantum Espresso and using DFPT. There are alternatives indeed. Uh, that, uh, so, uh, in particular, uh, I can show you here, uh, it's in the PDF, it's left as an exercise to try to rep reproduce this calculation because it may take a bit of time, especially if you do it in your own computer and not on a cluster, but we can inspect a bit the input files just to have an idea of what's going on here. So this is uh, here Raman header PWE is an input file of Quantum Espresso to compute the uh, effective charges, the electric tensor, and Raman uh, tensors. So this is uh, just a, this is the header, you have to attach the structure, actually this is a IBRAV zero, so you attach just the coordinate and the unit cell uh, below this, as we see in other uh, tutorials. And this is the standard SEF calculation. The only thing to pay attention here are two, actually. One is that we need to use LDA, because Raman tensor is implemented only with LDA in uh, Quantum Espresso. This is usually not a good, I mean, you can think, okay, oh, wow, LDA is terrible uh, as a function. Actually, if you want just to look to Raman tensor, it's, it's uh, so to only compute the in Raman intensity, LDA does a very good job usually. So it's not that big of, a, of an approximation. And the other point here is not specified that the pseudo potential should be not conserving because the implementation for Raman tensor and, and uh, Born effective charges work with non-conserving non pseudo potential. So these are the two limitations that must be taken care. But we need this only to get Raman tensor and, uh, and effective, Born effective charges. So we run this uh, uh, calculation, it's a standard PW calculation of quantum espresso. You have the input file, by the way, you can uh, inspect and try to run it yourself. Uh, and we need then to do actually the DFPT calculation, which I have here Raman complete.phi. And so this is actually another calculation. Maybe it's a bit uh, in the end, so I can try to open with. Uh, this other editor, so you can maybe look at it better from above. Okay, so uh, you can see this is the uh, input file for ph.x, and actually the interesting thing is L Raman, which is the flag to compute the Raman tensor, must be set to true. Trans, which is the flag to compute the phonons, here we set to false because we don't need to compute phonons. And zeta eu, which is a flag to compute the effective charge, we set to true. And then we specify gamma, because indeed the calculation needs to be done on that gamma. So this is a very simple input file for ph.x to compute just a Raman tensor effective charge. So this file will not produce any dynamical matrix as an output, but just a file with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, so what's going on here? It's not, uh, okay. So, will not produce any, um, will not produce any uh, dynamical metrics, but if we inspect the output file here, so this is the output file from the phonon calculation, and we go down, uh, we have the standard uh, things that, okay, we have, you can see the electric field calculation. So we have the dielectric constant here, the, sta the uh, static dielectric constant. We have the effective charges. So for each atom, the effective charge is a non-symmetric matrix. And you can see here for each, so this is oxygen, uh, hydrogen. So this is uh, the water, the ice structure. And, uh, and after this, we have the calculation of the uh, Raman tensor that is written on this file. So how do we import this data into a SHA uh, object. So what we need is actually, and this is also related to what Raffaello was presenting this morning, so these are also needed as information if you want to include a Leotio splitting in your phonon dispersion. So this is actually a bit more general than just computing Raman and infrared. So effective charges and the electric tensor are important for doing interpolation and to simulate the Leotio splitting. So if you want, the code automatically takes into account this quantity when it has this quantity. 
So you must tell at a certain point in the code what are these quantities. And up to now it was very hidden. And actually the location where these quantities are stored usually is inside the dynamical matrices. So if you are a bit familiar with the format of quantum espresso, you may uh, already know how they are uh, uh, stored inside. But in this case, I don't have them. Uh, so we, we, we will put uh, this data inside the dynamical matrix ourselves. Likely we don't need to copy and paste them inside the dynamical matrix because it would be very easy to do errors in this way. There is actually a tool to do this within the uh, SHA. So let's start by uh, preparing a script that uh, takes the output from uh, the quantum espresso phonon calculation that computes the dynamical matrix and effective charges, uh, sorry, the effective charges and Raman tensor, and put inside the final dynamical matrix that we have uh, somewhere, final din i's. Actually, here it is. Can you see it? Maybe, I don't know. If, uh, everyone, I hope everyone can see this. <laughs> uh, this final underscore din underscore i's, which is the end of a sham minimization. So I already give you the final auxiliary phonons that you get from a sham minimization. Yeah. So how do we do? So let's say uh, get uh, Raman here tensor dot pi. So now in this file, we need to load the dynamical matrices. So we import our favorite package, cell constructor. Uh, as CC to be just faster when uh, we type it, and the phonon module we need, so cell constructor dot phonons. Okay, and we just need this module, so we load the final dynamical matrices, which is CC dot phonons. So we, from the phonon module, we uh, initialize the phonon object. It's a bit redundant as a expression, but. And uh, now this is called final. So let me so let me uh, split in, this in two so that we can see. So it's called final underscore dean underscore ice one. So we call it in this way final underscore dean underscore ice. The one we can omit since uh, this is a calculation on a privity cell. So the, our super cell is a one by one by one. Okay. So in this case, there is only one Q point, which is gamma. So we don't need to put the latest number here, uh, because it's automatically loaded with the dynamical matrix. And then we need to specify the number of Q points, irreducible Q points, which in this case is one. Okay, this is how you loaded all the other dynamical matrices. You can omit this if you want, if you load only one dynamical matrix. So let's try to do the mistake of, uh, of doing it in this way. So what happens if we actually do, uh, call the full uh, 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 file and we try to uh, load this so you will see an error it says that final underscore dina is called ice one one doesn't exist because it tried to load uh, the uh, it tried to put the one after the name because it knows that there should be so we just remove the last one from his oh sorry ice and now it should not give error exactly so now it ran correctly so we can, for example, also display the structure. So we import ASC, ASC.visualizer. Uh, uh, and then we plot the structure just to view it. Dot view. So this command allowed us to display the structure. And we need to pass the structure, which is stored inside the dynamical matrix dot structure. And if we do like that, the code will give another error. So if you can see it. So, oops. Well, that was not the error I was expecting. Uh, why? No. No, no. It's, it's telling us that visualizer is not working. Why? Uh, probably. Let's just try. Visualize, not visualizer. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So. Right. <sighs> Thanks. 
okay, yes, this is the error I was expecting. <laughs> so this time it's telling us that this is not an ASA object. So to fix it, we need to convert this structure into an ASA atom. So get ASC atoms. So now we have an ASA object, and we should be able to see the ice structure. Here it is. I hope, okay, you can see it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. So, you can see this is the uh, this is the biggest primitive cell, not the biggest system, but we simulated because it's just a one by one by one uh, super cell. But uh, this tells you that we can simulate with this method also systems that have low symmetry, like this one. It's not very high symmetric. So now what we want to do now is uh, to uh, insert Raman and uh, effective charges inside the dynamical matrix. So to do that, we have likely a function which is uh, uh, read info from Espresso. <laughs> so this function here actually knows how to parse an output file of the phonon uh, program and uh, read all the data that it needs there. And the uh, file name is uh, this one here. Oops, uh, let me just copy. Oops, how do I? Okay, like this. And now we can save this file like save QE with uh, DIN final uh, polarization, something like that. Okay, that's nice. If we now run the program, is it should run and display again. And now if we look at the dynamical matrix, so final, no, it's called the final uh, pole one. So if we look at the dynamical matrix, at a certain point, we should have the dielectric tensor. Exactly, we have the dielectric tensor inside, the effective charges, and the Raman tensor all inside the dynamical matrix that we generated. Now that we have this data, if you use this dynamical matrix for doing interpolation, you would automatically take into account them to do LO to splitting. So someone was asking me before, if I don't want to do the interpolation with the effective charge, just remove this fat data from the dynamical matrix, and this you have to do by hand. Or you can set to non the uh, object button. So. <laughs> and it will ignore LO to splitting. Okay? So this is what just uh, a bit of... Uh, uh, stretching, let's say, before <laughs> doing the actual uh, td -Sha calculation. Now that we have, we can continue to work on this file, actually. Uh, now that we have the dynamical matrix, the final dynamical matrix, we can start the time dependence SHA calculation to get the phonon. So how do we do that? We need to import the SHA module and the SHA dot ensemble, uh, ensemble. Uh, module from the SHA uh, package, which will store stores the information of uh, our uh, ensemble, the latest one that we use for the minimization, and we need to import also the time-dependent SHA package, and uh, from the time-dependent SHA package, we need to load the dynamical lengths module. <laughs> now, this is very long to write, so I will use DL as alias for this module, just because it's I'm uh, lazy. Okay, so this uh, package are required now. So what we do is we now load the ensemble. How to do that? So we define the ensemble and we load it with the SSCHA dot ensemble. So we access to the ensemble module and we define an ensemble object. So also this one is a bit redundant. <laughs> Now, we need to pass the dynamical matrix to define the system, which in this case, the, the one we just imported is fine. And we need to tell him the temperature. Now, this ensemble was generated at 0 Kelvin, so we will use 0. Okay? So you have seen maybe sometimes they specify also the supercell. With the latest version of the code, this is no more required. The code automatically uh, uh, gets the supercell from the dynamical matrix. So you can avoid to specify the supercell whenever you want. And now we need to load the ensemble from the raw data. Uh, okay, so to load the ensemble, we just need assemble.load. 
And the data of the ensemble are reported in this data directory that I show. If we load the data directory, like in the first tutorial that you see a huge number of files, actually it's my fault if you take a lot to unpack this uh, directory because these are 10,000 configuration and you have uh, forces, stresses, configuration, so you have 40,000 files, um, apologies. Also because I think we are not going to use all of them just so that the code is faster, so we just say data, the population is number two, and how many configurations do we want to load? We could load 10,000, but uh, let's load only 1,000, uh, 1, so, so that uh, everything is going to be faster, and even if you have a, a slow computer. So it, it doesn't change uh, much for the purpose of this uh, lecture. So now we have the ensemble loaded, and what we need to do is, so this ensemble now works with the, uh, with the uh, original dynamical matrix that we used to generate the ensemble, which is the one that, if I uh, remember you, is, uh, oh, I think actually not. So we probably need to load this dynamical matrix before. So let's say din start is equal to, sorry for the confusion, so we are loading the dynamical matrix used to generate the ensemble, which is this one here, start in eyes. Okay? And so we need to specify to the ensemble that this is the starting dynamical matrix. Okay? So this ensemble is using the starting dynamical matrix, but we already did the SHA minimization, and we got the final one, so we don't want to redo, again, the SHA minimization. We want just to update the ensemble, to update the weights of the ensemble, to reflect the final dynamical matrix that we have at the end of the minimization. And uh, so that all the averages that we are going to compute during the TD SHA uh, evolution will be done with the weights of the configuration obtained with the latest dynamical matrix, which is the one that minimizes the free energy, not the one that has been used to generate the ensemble, because we use this trick of reweighting. So I don't know if it's very clear what's going on. If uh, it is not, you can ask. Uh, yes? Uh, now we are creating or reading those? We are reading, load. But uh, from where? From, there is a directory, which is called data, that is distributed with the code. And it's full of these all these files here, which okay. uh, which are uh, uh, forty thousand. Ah, okay. And uh, if uh, I apologies if uh, it takes a long time to unpack them yeah, because so it was. I, I opened this uh, directory and it didn't show any icons, but now I see that it's simply loading. Yeah, <laughs> so I I I was not a very good decision. So. Usually you should use save underscore bin, what was using Raffaello in the last uh, t tutorial, and load underscore bin, so that uh, it only have few binary files. But uh, uh, they are binary files, so I don't know if they work the same for all, uh, actually for all uh, kind of uh, architecture of the CPUs. Uh, so I use text file and actually encoded, so that I know that should they, they should be readable everywhere. But anyway, it would be better to use this underscore bin, which saves a lot of space and a lot of files, for sure. One question? Yeah. Uh, now you are going to update weights with the previously defined bin, no? Yeah. But is, 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 this, this is a question. Like, the ensemble wouldn't be the same as when I define the ensemble, I use that same bin. I, I could, instead of uh, when you define the ensemble, Yes, probably, probably, it's yes. Same, no? Probably I have should. To because my configurations are not correctly described in exactly. that ensemble, so I, yeah. I have that. The information I'm overwriting is equivalent. No? Yeah, yeah, it should be equivalent. I just want to be sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it's <laughs> for myself. Because okay, yeah, 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 it should be exactly the same. Okay, okay. now we are going to reweight, and to reweight is ensemble. Dot update weights. And now we need to pass the new dynamical matrix, which is DIN, the one which, in which we also loaded the effective charge on. It's important. 
And then we need a new temperature because in principle we can simulate different temperature with the same ensemble. So we, if we, this is particularly useful if you have a very uh, huge uh, ab initio calculation uh, which take a lot of time to compute an ensemble and with this trick you can do temperature which are close to the one you used to do that ensemble near that point. So it's a good trick to also to get, yeah. Is there a fast way to get, if you want to do that trick? To get the only ratio? Yes, except what we are going to do now. Ah, okay. So we have zero, and now we want to print how good is this ensemble. So we can print uh, the original number of configuration, uh, and this is ensemble.n, and we can also print uh, the effective uh, size, which is ensemble.get effective sample sites and uh, in this way if we now uh, start this function ensemble there is a mistake where is it and uh, these uh, uh, two lines above okay, Spanish uh, ensemble so the shower was uh, actually suggesting me how to change it. Okay, yes. And you can immediately see that uh, the original uh, size of the ensemble was 1,000. After we did this reweighting, it's like we lost uh, almost 200 configuration for this reweighting. So the new distribution is offset with the original one. And the effective number of configuration that we have is 833 which is still good because it's, if you do the ratio is uh, z above 0 0.8. If you remember, the good ratio is everything which is above 0 0.5, it's quite good. So it means this ensemble can be used. Indeed, it was obtained from a sham immunization. Now, this is the beginning. Up to now, I just did the things that were more or less in common with the previous uh, tutorials. Now, we need to actually do the time-dependent SHA calculation. And to do that, we initialize a new object, which... I usually call a Lanxos, which is the Lanxos algorithm. Yes? Yeah, I have just a question. When you loaded in the, the electric function and the full effective charges in the dynamic commuters, did it automatically update the uh, LO phonons? Or no. No, because uh, actually the LO phonons, so when you have a calculation done on a grid, the LO phonons are something that comes only in the interpolation. So if you have a grid, LO phonons are not affecting phonons on that grid. Actually, not even a gamma. It's a gamma LO phonons are not well defined because uh, even if it is true that uh, you have uh, a, the splitting a gamma, the splitting depends on the direction, and so it's not well defined. Even in isometric crystal, where the splitting does not depend on the, on the direction, what depends on the direction is the eigenvector of the mode you are splitting. So the dynamical metric is not defined. So that's why you are, you are not updating the frequencies. So you, that ca came into play only when you do interpolation. So, okay, we can go here. So we have the launches. We initialized the launches. So this is a DL because we imported with, t you see in some line, few lines above here, we Im imported tdsha dot the module dynamical launches as DL. So we can use this shortcut dot Lanxos. So this is a Lanxos object, and to get it work, we need to pass to the Lanxos object the ensemble, like this. And we are, essentially, this is because the time-dependent shunt needs to do the averages when it's evolving and propagating our density matrix, and so we need to pass the ensemble. And now all the rest is quite easy. We need to initialize it. So this essentially is initializing the symmetries to uh, speed up the calculation. Then we need to ask our uh, code to uh, what is the perturbation that we want to study. In this case, infrared. So let me import NumPy just as NP. And so to prepare the perturbation, we need to specify which is the polarization vector of the light which is uh, incoming into our radiation. So to that is lanxas dot prepare 
uh, ER, infrared. Okay, so this is a, to do an infrared spectrum. And now simply we want to pass the polarization of the incoming radiation of the electric field, which in this case we put along the 1, 0, 0 direction. So we define a numpy array, which is simply 1, 0, 0. So this is the, the incoming polarization of light. Okay? I think we, we could uh, pass it as a keyword. So if you go to the PDF, uh, this is uh, written. Uh, uh, so we have, we are here. So Paul Vec is the keyword. Let's use the keyword so it's clearer what we are doing. It's Paul underscore Vec. So this polarization vector of the light. Okay. And now with Lanxos.run ft right now which stays for finite temperature we, this is uh, will be uh, also right uh, in a future version probably we'll just uh, launch us dot run right now is ft because we had different algorithms before for, for finite temperature at t equals zero but now they are all the same and we need to pass this algorithm the number of uh, of uh, steps so let's start with 50 and then let's save the results and the results, what is the result of a Lanchos calculation? Is the, as Antonio was presenting this morning, is the three diagonal matrix that you get. So uh, is this sequence of three coefficients, A, B, C, which A is the, are the coefficient on the diagonal matrix, and B and C are the coefficient on the diagonal above and diagonal just below. So save A, B, C is saving these coefficients. We save them as uh, er.abc. Now, if we don't specify anything else, this is a full calculation which includes all EF, the effects of harmonicity. It's including third order uh, scattering, it's including fourth order form of scattering, even beyond the bubble approximation that Raffaello presented this morning. So this is a full dynamic, it's no mode mixing, so it's mixing also the phonons, so there is no approximation, whatever, apart from the, sh the, the approximation done by the TD sha. So this is the full uh, green function. Okay, so if we run this, I hope it will be fast, it should be fast. Okay, not that much fast, I hope faster. So it is going, and these uh, data that you see here are actually uh, these steps, and it's uh, of the Lanchos uh, simulations. Now, while it's uh, running, I, uh, we can indeed do some kind of approximation. One of these is the bubble approximation. We can do the calculation in this regime. But we can also do something a bit more crude before and neglecting all the phonon scattering, so having only uh, Sha auxiliary phonons. And to do that, it's very simple. It's langsos.ignore uh, underscore v3. And if we put this equal to true, we are ignoring third order scattering, and if we ignore also fourth order, before we are only we are not seeing any kind of phonon scattering. So if if we ignore just the v4, we are in the bubble approximation. Okay, we can re, uh, change now uh, this output in, uh, for example, here uh, only auxiliary. Okay. And we can rerun this, and this will be extremely fast. Okay, it's already done, you see. Because we are not actually doing uh, any kind of propagation. We can plot the result. So TD SHA plot. Uh, and, and then we can just pass the ABC file, for example, ER. I think here this thing is not. Uh, okay. <laughs> T, uh, so it was TD SHA plot. And then the ABC file, for example, here, only auxiliary ABC. And you see, since these are only auxiliary phonons, this is the infrared spectrum that you get. Uh, so we have only three in infrared, uh, infrared active modes. This at high frequency is the stretching, uh, OH stretching. Then we have bending, and we have some, I think, molecular rotation, uh, or I think. So, <laughs> so uh, this is, uh, uh, and as you can see, the phonon have infinite lifetime because are non-interacting one. This already includes some level of anharmonicity because they are the Sha auxiliary phonons are not harmonic. 
but still they, the approximation we did here is like putting the self-energy equal to zero. So we don't have self-energy effects, we don't have a finite lifetime, okay? And you can see, we can maybe keep this, uh, no, let's close and because, uh, okay, let's uh, do like this. Okay, so we have uh, still this and we can compare. And let's compare with what we obtain with the full uh, uh, SHA result that we computed before, which was ER.abc. So this includes also four order components, and it's quite different. And I will spend a few words explaining what the difference is. So we have these two spectrum, okay? So first of all, you can see that the number of peaks is very different between the two. The two. Uh, so this is. You can still recognize some of them. So for example, these modes probably is the same. This mode here seems here, and here, I mean, there are a lot of things, so it's very difficult to understand. So what is going on? Let me uh, let me go to the PDF so that I can explain a bit what is going on. So, uh, okay, yes. So, can you see this equation? So, this is the continued fraction equation. So, it's how, how we are plotting the green function. And so, this A1, B1, C1, A2, C2, B2 are all the coefficients that our algorithm computes each step. So, this in this case, we had 50 steps. And this means that each step we are adding a new denominator to this expression. So each, each step we do with the lunches, we are adding a pole to our green function. So you can see from here that we have much more poles than here. Okay? The simulation converge when we have a sufficient large number of poles so that they got, get close enough with a distance which is smaller than the smearing that we are using, and the smearing is exactly the same smearing that Raffaello was presenting this morning. And when we have uh, something like that, we finally get a smooth uh, curve. So we can redo the plot with the smearing, and to do that we simply, uh, we can use uh, this uh, same uh, script here, we can pass to the script the frequency range, for example, from 0 to 4,000, and then we can put in centimeters to minus 1 the smearing. Let's put 50, which is a lot, 50 centimeters to minus 1, just to see the result. And you can see that now it's much better. Okay? Now, it's, this is a very big smearing, but already, already you can see something very interesting here. For example, so you see that this has two peaks, and if you look at experimental data that was presenting also this morning, Antonio, the actual experiment has two peaks here and not one. And then you see the one of the combination mode that Antonio was uh, showing, and is this peak here, which actually in the one by one by one supercell is bigger than it should be. So if you, if you enlarge a supercell and do this study on a bigger supercell and converge this, uh, this thing, uh, uh, this gets smaller and smaller but remain present. This object here, if you look at the uh, density of states of the phonon, doesn't exist in ice. So you don't have phonons at 2,250 uh, uh, centimeters to the minus 1. And uh, this phonon here is actually a sum of uh, modes at lower frequency. Okay? Now this is a bit different from what was uh, explaining Antonio. It's not a two-phonon effect, but it's the fact that uh, if you have your... Uh, if we take the green function, this, uh, the anharmonic green function, we have uh, something, so this is the interaction electron, so this is the photon, creates a pair of electron all in the infrared, then we have the phonons, but now we have all anharmonicity inside, and within the anharmonicity we may have uh, diagrams that do something like that. Okay, so within the process, there are also terms, uh, one phonon terms that do something like that. So you have one phonon propagator, but here in the middle, they scatter with two phonons. They generate a two phonon propagator. And this means that uh, you can actually have uh, 
if, uh, if this scattering rate is sufficiently big, you can excite the two phonons through a single phonon excitation. And so you could even have a peak and a in a combination mode, even if uh, this is only coupled with uh, linear phonons. Okay, and this is what's happening here, because here we are not considering two phonons effect directly, but they are within the phonon propagator. And so this spectrum here actually includes O and harmonicity. You can do a study, and I uh, suggest you try to do right now, so that uh, we have, to increase the number of steps and uh, change between 50 and 100, or 50 and 10, and see what is the difference uh, and what is the smearing that you require to converge the calculation? Indeed, uh, you should also converge the calculation then with the supercell side, but we are not doing this now because, <laughs> of, for obvious reason. Okay, so try to play a bit with this, and this I think is a good time to uh, stop for questions if you have. No question. Okay. So, what is the number of uh, these? Uh Steps, step. Is it does it scale with the size? You, I mean, the frequency range, or how do you so this is a, uh, these are difficult ones. This is difficult to answer, and uh, my ex my experience it, it scales with the anharmonicity. So if you have a, a very harmonic system, your peak will be very sharp, and so actually your spectrum will all the peaks you generate will be very close to each other. So even with a small smearing, you will be able to even with very few steps. So in principle, if you have a harmonic system, you need very few steps, even if it's very big, very few steps to converge. I have a perfectly harmonic system, and I have three peaks. I expect three peaks. Is the three steps enough? Or? Yeah. Okay. If you have a perfectly harmonic, uh, not only if you have a perfectly harmonic system, if the code should, in this is not the case because there is always a bit noise, the code should stop exactly at, uh, after three steps. Oh, so you can actually, like if I give it very a large number, it will stop. I mean, in a, this is never the case because uh, you have noise, uh, and this noise is propagating uh, in a bad way. So this is why, so if you, you, you there are many ways uh, to compute the actual uh, spectral function. One of these is using the, le using the Lehman representation. The problem is that at a certain point, the vector that you are generating are no more, no more orthonormal, and so the code will never be able to reach the condition in which it stops a, a, a alone. And this also is usually true with very few steps, after very few steps. Uh, but the good thing is that uh, the discontinued fraction description remain very good. Uh, so in principle, if you have a small system, uh, the code is, a, at a certain point, the code realizes that uh, the, new, uh, the new vector that it generated uh, is uh, linearly dependent from the previous one. And uh, if it is like that, the algorithm stops and it's converged. This is never reached in practice, uh, even in, if I perfectly my system. Yeah? How is it scales? Because I require a number of configurations in ensemble. This, this is very difficult. Usually it increases. Uh, I would say it increases almost linearly with the number of atoms. Uh, but, I mean, it's very difficult to say because uh, there are competing effects. So from one side, uh, the number of configuration is proportional to the anharmonicity. So the bigger you go in the supercell, the anharmonic uh, contribution that you have uh, are tend to be localized in space. So at a certain point, you arrive, you arrive in a region in which, in principle, if you get a larger supercell, the auxiliary SHA force constant matrix describe well those regions which is harmonic. And since all the average we do are always differences, between uh, uh, harmonic and uh, real quantities, this, this uh, uh, object should converge very well and should fluctuate very little. From the other side, you are increasing the number of degrees of freedom. And so to get good uh, integrals, you, you should have a larger number of uh, configurations. So I would say it's very difficult to give an estimate on how many configurations you need. Just the you have the Hmm? The 10,000 configurations is a converged or? This uh, is, yes, it is converged, yeah. But it's not converged with a supercell. So this is too small. Yeah, so, but 
if ah, I converge okay. with the Hessian, does that mean I'm converge with this? Z, well? Yes, exactly. For, for, of course, the, the conversion is the same. Because the average you are computing is actually the same. There is one question there. I have a small comment and question because regarding the, the previous one, the, the first one, when you, when you show the, let's say, unharmonic inverse with auxiliary distinction, when you have only three yeah. modes with infinite lifetime. Let me take them back. Uh, this one. I think yeah. that regardless the advantage of using the spectral you know, functions calculated, this has already advantage of, and correct me if I'm wrong, over MD simulation, for instance. So if you want to get the vibrational density of, say, the protein generator, and this is very easy enough to interpret, uh, well, in practice for polyatomic molecules, the inelasticity of scattering experiment, basically. Uh, you basically run the MD simulation, and then you refer to Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think that the, still I am close to the normal mode concept. Yeah. So I can interpret the, the influence of unharmonicity on the. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, so, so these are the auxiliary phonons. These are not the fully dressed and harmonic phonons. But still, if you have a harmonic picture, then auxiliary phonons, dynamical phonons, physical phonons, all of these quantities coincide and are the same thing. So if your system is slightly anharmonic, probably this is already a good description. And this is what, by the way, uh, also uh, Jon and uh, Francesco show in the first, uh, in the first slide the, the dispersion of uh, palladium hydride was obtained with these auxiliary phonons and was already matching quite well the experiment, even in a system which was very anharmonic. Can you somehow rescale the Yeah, so you, what you want to do in that case is to plot the spectral function. So to do that, we can, we can actually uh, have a look right now. You can select each mode on your system and prepare a perturbation on that mode. Now in VR, we are preparing the infrared perturbation, but we can perturb the system on a mode. If we do prepare mode, and now we just give the number of the... Of, uh, the number of energy, like they are, are, for example, we can say the tenth, and do. Uh, yeah, it's a lung sauce, yes, sir. Yes, you are right. And here uh, we uh, add a comment. Where are. Okay, comment is here. All right. Yeah. <laughs> So it's, if we do like that, I mean, let me also not overwrite the file. So, um, this is mod what is happening? Mode 10, let's try that. Okay, and if we now run this, uh, which is get RAM and air tensor. Uh, okay, of course, that, that's what I was telling you. It's converging one step because in this case we have no anharmonicity. So we have only one step and it converged. And so if we now, I, I don't know if he saved us something. <laughs> 
here, so let's uh, try. I don't know if it's going to work because it's only, yes, of course. It's only, it's only one, so we need to turn on this thing to at least this one for the, having the bubble approximation. No, this is not working, this one here. Okay. And so now it's computing the spectral function of that mode. And when it tends, we can... So you can see that bubble approximation and full anharmonic description in this picture, the difference in computational cost is a factor of two, no matter the size of the system. Uh, was what happened? Ah, yes, of course. Yeah, you see, you have only one mode, and you can already see the anharmonicity a bit, which is creating this. Uh, Combinate, so it's coupling a bit this mode with something else, but uh, this is a very harmonic mode. And this is one single mode. You have to do this for all the modes, and you have your spectral function for all the modes. Yeah, yeah, of course. That, that, not only what you can do, I've not, I'm not trying to show this. What you can do, you can select only few modes and compute the ER spectrum only considering those modes. And so, for example, if you see, want to interpret a peak, if uh, it's a combination of other peaks, uh, you can exclude some bands region, and if that peak disappears, then it's, you know what, what are the modes that are uh, originating that. I simply replace the perturbation, which is, by the way, what we are going to do also to do the Raman. It's not going to be that different. From the ER to the prepare mode, and then I ask for the tenth mode. So the mode are ordered in frequency. So you should see the frequency in the supercell how they are ordered to pick the right one. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a thing. But not only what we can actually do, and I mean I have not the time to. I mean maybe we can show this. We can actually see what is the Eschan free energy action of this mode, because we can, we have the solution at all frequency, this is another difference with respect to the other spectral function calculation, so that uh, once we have the coefficient, uh, the green function is just this equation, which is, a, so the frequency we put a posteriori, and also the smearing. So this means that we can do just the calculation once and then have all the frequency, including the, the limit omega that goes to zero, which coincides with the static limit, which is the action, the free energy action. So we can actually compute what is the free energy action of this mode with uh, convergence analysis on this mode 10.abc. And you will plot a lot of stuff, OK? And this is the static frequency of the mode. You can see the action as a function of the number of iterations. And I, you can see it converge quite qu quickly to its value. And so if you would compute the free energy action of this mode, this is what you would get. Okay, and you can, in this way, you can also see as a function of the number of steps if it's converged or not. Is the no mode missing approximation implicit? Here? Yes. Always? Yes. When you do this thing for the Hessian, it's always implicit. So but in general, no. No, in general, no. Because that, that is the difference between, so the, that is a bit of the difference between the two approaches. So this approach is actually doing the green function. So it has all the mixing mode in the green function. The free energy action is the inversion of the green function. So when we do the inversion, here what we are saying, we are computing the dynamical green function of that mode, and then we are saying that the free energy action is the invert of that element. So we, are, we should do the inversion of a matrix, which we are not doing. And this is the no mode mixing approximation that we are doing when we get the free energy action. On the opposite, we have the full interacting picture on the direct. Uh, when we did the same thing with the, with the spectral code, uh, it was exactly the opposite. So we have access uh, to the bubble, to the self-energy, which is the complete self-energy. But this is the denominator on the green function. So if we want then the green function, uh, or the spectral function, which is the imaginary part, uh, we should invert uh, the full spectral function which is a matrix. And so what we usually do in the no-mode mixing approximation is that we take only the diagonal part, so 
and then we invert them separately, which is the normal mixing. So they are complementary in this uh, aspect. I don't know if. Uh, <laughs> so you have these are uh, uh, oh, how is it evolving? If you, if I zoom, uh, how the green function is uh, is evolving in time with the number of steps. So you have this kind of plot here. You have the plot of the dynamical green function of these things as a function of the number of steps. So you can see if you are converging or not. So these kind of plots are generated are very useful to see if you are converged or not with the spectrum. And you have these uh, td sha convergence analysis, uh, which is installed with the td sha software. So I think we need to go on, uh, OK, to be on time. Because this was the infrared. Uh, you can play a bit around also changing the polarization vector. So actually, if you want to do infrared of uh, unpolarized light, is simply equal to the average of doing the infrared along the different polarizations, orthogonal within them. So it's quite easy. With Raman, it's a bit more complex. And so we have. I have a comment on IR. I know that the LO both are high. You mentioned that are not very well defined in the theory of right? But experimentally, you yeah. have to have the same case. Yeah. Don't forget that you can enter any potential lab and do IR experiments, for example, in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So I look. In this case, yeah. The gray shape for the Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree on that. And actually, I think I don't know. I don't remember if it is implemented right now, but we, I think we will implement it in any way any, very soon. Uh, you can account uh, for, for effective charges at gamma by uh, giving, which is actually the Q vector of the, of the incoming radiation. And in that case, you break the degeneracy. And you can account for, for a low. Exactly, exactly. Exactly, because actually, yes, the infrared and Raman, they are not exactly a Q equals zero, they are Q close to zero. So you have actually, yes, in those experiments. I agree with you. So let's pass to the Raman part. And uh, it's, it is actually very similar. So Antonio presented this uh, this morning. Uh, he called Kai, I called it alpha. Uh, sorry for the different notations. This is the polarizability, polarizability response function. But there is a different, an intrinsic difference between Raman and infrared is that while infrared is an absorption uh, experiment, Raman is a scattering experiment. And so there is a difference in the prefactor. And actually, this means that Raman has two types of, uh, uh, it can be detected in two ways, which is Stokes and anti-Stokes. And this change, the intensity of the prefactor, which depends on the Bose occupation number, as Antonio Siciliano was explaining this morning. So we need, uh, to account for this, we need to actually multiply the signal we get from the re uh, response function with the Bose occupation number plus one if we are looking at the Stokes intensity. And uh, this we will show you this later. So the concept is exactly the same with the polarizability, polarizability response function. Polarizability can be uh, expanded in a Taylor series, and we stop here at the first order, which means that how it changed with the position, or if you want with time, is that uh, the dependence of time of polarizability is actually the dependence of time of the atomi, uh, atoms under the hood, and then uh, the polarizability change with atomic position. So this is the dependence of time or on frequency if you are in the frequency domain. And the derivative of uh, polarizability, which is the derivative of total energy with respect to two electric fields, uh, with respect to an atomic position, is a third derivative of the, th of the energy, which Antonio introduced this uh, uh, morning, which is the Raman tensor. So, there, the Raman tensor does not depend on some frequency, right? It just no, it doesn't depend on frequency. So, but this omega you have in the derivative, so it's, uh, it's an approximation somehow, right? So so, yeah, so we are saying that, uh, no, so, no, this is no, should not be omega. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm right. Uh, you are right. So we will fix it. This should not be omega. So this is a static uh, dependence of uh, 
of the position, but then the position depends on time. Yeah. I'm trying to run one. The, the one ignoring the both the relative time and the four of them. Every run should keep the same result, no? Every run of the yeah. there's nothing to that. Yeah. 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 So you should get my same poles. Yeah, yeah. That means that I'm not getting exactly the same. And you, have you put? A, 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 is the polarization uh, correct? Yeah, the, one, is, zero, zero. yeah. Prepare. Yeah, that should yeah, be. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can check later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's going on? So in the intensity is actually this one here. So the previous code only plots this first part, which would be what you get in an in a in a absorption experiment. But since it's a scattering, we need to add this extra term. And so this is what we are going to do uh, right now. So to prepare the Raman, we have you have the snippet of code. It's exactly very similar to whatever what we have done right now. Simply change prepare here with prepare in prepare mode with prepare raman nothing so surprising but this time you have two polarization vector because it's a scattering experiment you have two electric fields the incoming radiation and the outcoming radiation so you need to specify which is the polarization of light in the incoming radiation outcoming radiation it depends on your lab now all this is done in the hypothesis that you know your crystal orientation so single crystal you control polarization of light we will see in a moment how to do things even beyond this, this, this case, which is still very interesting because it allows you to select indeed the modes and to study more in detail the system if you are able to do that. So we simply substitute here and we say Langsas dot prepare Raman Paul vec in. So let's, uh, let's use the same uh, polarization in coming and outcoming. You can try different ones just to have a, get an idea on how the, this work. You can also try mixing the incoming and outcoming polarization. And this can also be interesting. So let, for now I put the same just just for just for no particular reasons. <laughs> but uh, so we can run this one here. So let, let me rename this as Raman uh, okay so we are running in the bubble approximation it's a bit faster not that much mm -hmm. yes you are right so we take yes it's doing the Raman so each one of these is a step. You see the A, B, C coefficient, which are printed also in output. And this can be run in parallel. Eh? If you run with MPI run, it will work in parallel. I've not put it here, but actually, let me show you. There is, if you install with Julia, there is the guide how to do that. We can actually put Langsos here dot mod equal DL dot, uh, I think it's mod past Julia. You, you don't see anything else. I think like that should do the trick. If we now rerun this, but this time with Python-JL, which is the Julia announced version of Python, and we run this again, should be much faster. Let's see. The first step takes a bit more time because it's compiling the Julia code, and it is already ended. So you get a factor of between 10 and 15 of speed, which is very good, actually. Okay, so in this way, if you are using in this way, you can go to much higher than 50. <laughs> so now we can plot the Raman. Let's put again between 0, 4,000 centimeters minus minus 1 and 50 uh, centimeters minus 1. Not weird, even a bit too big. And it's, so this is the Raman spectrum that we get. We can use a bit lower smearing because it was too smeared out. Okay, this is a bit too less. So you, you can you can plot 
smearing uh, I increase the number of steps to get a bit of idea on uh, what are the parameters needed to converge so you need a bit to play around with these things but this is not the actual Raman spectrum because uh, as I was telling you this is what we would get with uh, 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 an absorption experiment we must add that n plus one to get the actual response function so now we will use a new script we create a new script to parse the data we just generated with the launchers and this will also allow you to get a bit more insight of what is going on. So just plot, let's call it this way. And this is for the Raman, so we need to import only, I think, NumPy, because we will need NumPy for sure, and also matplotlib. Uh, so this is for plotting. And now we import the tdsha and tdsha.dynamical launches. As DL, so that it's shorter, I just like to give this acronym. <laughs> so now we don't need to import anymore the ensemble because the calculation has already been done. We don't need the ensemble anymore, we just need to analyze it. So we do Lanxos, and this is DL.Lanxos, and we can pass without anything inside. This will create an empty Lanxos algorithm. So we now just load the coefficient load abc and we have the data in raman.abc okay like this now we want the raman green function and we can access to this quantity so this is the continued fraction with the function lanxos get green function continued fraction so this is the green function from continuous fraction. We specify this because there is also the implementation get green function with Lehmann representation, uh, which doesn't work that good, but so don't use it. <laughs> but uh, And now we need to pass the uh, values of the frequency at which we want to compute the green function. And we define here the frequency in centimeters to the minus one which is a uniform array between 0 for 1,000, and we use, we, since we can exaggerate, we use uh, 100,000 of uh, values of the frequencies, doesn't matter. And then the smearing, we say 30 centimeters to the minus 1. Now, the Lanchos algorithm wants everything works in Rydberg units, so we need to convert the frequency in Rydberg, and now, likely, we give... Uh, inside cell constructor uh, there is a units module which can do the conversion for us so we need to convert centimeter to the minus one to Rydberg so we divide the cc dot Rydberg to centimeters to the minus one this is the, the way of doing it so this number here if multiplied by something convert Rydberg in centimeter to the minus one so if we divide, it converts to the opposite conversion. And it's and also for the smearing, we put the smearing. Also, this one wants to be in Rydberg, so cc.units, read to cyan. And that's it. And uh, this is the green function. It's an array uh, which contains complex numbers because it's a real and imaginary part. So if you need, for example, for the infrared to get the full dielectric function, the real and imaginary part, which are uh, uh, related to the refractive index, so, so the real part could be interesting if you want to do, for example, reflectivity. Uh, this gets you both real and imaginary part. Now we need to select only, in this case, the imaginary part. So let's say spectrum is equal to Raman, is equal to, this is like the spectral functions minus the imaginary part, of the Raman green function. And this is exactly what was plotted by the previous code. We need to multiply by the Bose occupation number plus one, which is inside the dynamical Lanchos module, there is the Bose occupation function. We need to pass again the frequency in Rydberg. So we convert in Rydberg. So be careful about the conversions. And plus one. And uh, now we have the spectrum with the correct prefactor. Yeah? You mentioned the Bosse occupation factor, right? And again, referring to experiments where 
Raman response depends on the fourth power on the expected laser. Uh, yeah, you, we are, we are, here we are uh, considering, uh, we are, uh, so, yes, so here there is no the frequency, it, this is the frequency of the Rama shift, yeah. so we are, we are, uh, this is, uh, so often also in experiment it's very difficult to get uh, absolute units for Raman, uh, so, so it's very, so for this we are neglecting uh, the uh, energy of the incoming radiation, because uh, this is has to be interpreted as, uh, so for the Raman it's very difficult to get uh, an, in, uh, an intensity which is meaningful by itself. So we, we care about relative intensities here. Yeah, but uh, the, the, the boson occupation factor depends on omega. Yeah, the boson, yeah, the boson occupation yeah. factor depends on the vibrational energy, so it changes the relative, yeah. the relative intensity but of it. But we can be added after, just by the multiplication exactly. factor. Exactly. But eventually it would be nice maybe to put them out as an optimum. Yeah, it would be nice. Because you should multiply by n of omega plus 1. Yeah, it's, it's a, also missing. The one over omega is no, this is present in the green function. Uh, so we have uh, uh, the frequency, we can use the one in centimeters, and then the spectrum. If we do like that and we show the result, we should get exactly. Nice. Dot units. You units. In many places. Nice. Yeah, of course, both occupation numbers requires also the temperature, which is in Kelvin. In this case, it's zero. So in this case, both occupation number zero Kelvin is uh, zero. So we get exactly the same as an absorption. <laughs> experiment, but because we are doing the calculation at zero Kelvin, but if indeed if we uh, now start adding the temperature, I mean, it will not matter that much until we arrive, I mean, it will matter for the low energy part, of course, the temperature, in this case, mostly high energy. So it will suppress high energy uh, uh, modes with respect to low energy ones, which are easier to see in a Raman experiment. Yes? In the other file, so I can open it here, is, uh, was uh, get uh, Raman, I think this was the file. So in the end, we have, uh, after we prepare the Raman, I don't know if you can see, maybe I can zoom even a little bit more. So in the end of the file, we have uh, prepare Raman, which is preparing the Raman calculation. Then here we are just doing the bubble approximation. We can... You can choose if you uh, put also files here, uh, if you, especially if you use the Julia mode, uh, it's super fast, so it doesn't matter actually. Then run for how many steps, and here we are saving the Raman.abc file. So after the launch is done and all the calculation of the ABC coefficients are done, this is saved. Okay, so we have 10 minutes, which is really not that much to conclude. And uh, so, Actually, since I'm a bit sadic, uh, in these last 10 minutes we will do the most difficult thing of all. <laughs> which is how to do unpolarized Raman calculation. Which actually is very important. <laughs> so, unpolarized Ramans uh, can be done, so all, all, everything, both the infrared and Raman spectrum that you compute up to now, was done with, uh, uh, you have to specify the polarization of the light, and you have a fixed orientation of the crystal. Okay, but luckily the, it, there is a, a minimum number of independent Raman uh, calculation that you can do that if you average with the proper coefficient give you the answer of an unpolarized system or a powder system or a system without, if you want, uh, uh, with not a single crystal, which is very useful in many application actually, which is the case of many spectra that you have. So these are the response function. Are, uh, this is the so-called are the so-called invariants. There are the minimum number of uh, perturbation you need to compute, and so these are all uh, square perturbation, which means they are perturbation that are the same on left and right, which is very good because they are the only kind of perturbation we implemented right now in the uh, code uh, distributed. So you can see the first perturbation is just a polarization on x-axis. 
probability on xx, probability on yy, plus probability on zz, divided by 3. Uh, so it's just like that. Then we have uh, xx minus yy, xx minus zz, zeta, yy minus zz, zeta, and then the mixed polarization, so xy, yz, and xz. So we need to do all these one after the other, and then the unpolarized Raman intensity is uh, this magic number, 45 times the first intensity plus 7 times the sum over all the other. So actually in unpolarized Raman, the most important one is this one here. Okay. Also because usually it's the most intense one as a response. Likely, you don't have to prepare this very ugly perturbation by yourself, but uh, if you pass to prepare Raman, the unpolarized keyword, you can select uh, which one of these uh, to run automatically. So if you say unpolarized equals zero, you will run the first response. Then if you say unpolarized equal to five, you will run the response B5. So how do we do this in practice? We do a for loop <laughs> and for i in range from zero to six included, so in Python we need to go to seven, and then we have uh, uh, this, uh, we need to uh, move this in, ooh, where is that? Okay, we need to move this into the uh, environment, and before anyone we want to reset the calculation, so that we are using the same Lanchos object all the time, and we reprepare the Raman, but this time instead of preparing the polarization vector, we prepare the unpolarized equal to i. And then we save Raman unpolarized. And then, oops. Uh, oh, I think it's like that. We can add here the i. So if we now run uh, So the first step is taking more because it's compiling Julia and then it's very fast. It's doing all of the calculation. And uh, so, if you look, we have all the unpolarized Raman calculation. And then, to plot the unpolarized Raman, and I, there is actually, we, we simply need to load all these files, get the spectrum for all these files, and then obtain the intensity as 45, the first one, and all the others, 7 by the other one. And that is unpolarized Raman. So this is maybe the most difficult thing. <laughs> to do, but it's useful because he, most of the experimental data you have are actually unpolarized. And we can, no, I think uh, we have five minutes, so I can try to do the plot here. Oh, I don't know if you prefer to ask questions. Do you want to ask questions? Or let's do the plot. Let's do the plot. Okay. 